We heard, we heard earlier about the confusion of travel and the weirdness of getting into this space and how some of the young filmmakers began to feel as strange as old age pensioners. Well, I actually am an old age pensioner, so it feels doubly strange. And also another difference here is that the people we've seen for the most part are artists and, are, and, and that is part of their practice, whereas I'm not an artist, I'm archive. I'm so old, I've gathered everything that I need and I cannibalize myself. So this kind of avoids permissions in some way. If you're drawing on yourself, it's a little bit easier. And that's what I want to demonstrate. Uh, we're going back into the, into the really distant past now. I began um, in the very early 1960s. When I was 18, I came from South Wales to Brixton, where there was a remnant of a film school operating above a butcher's shop in Electric Avenue. And what was great there was that it was on the point of collapse, so that all, all of the equipment was possibly going to be repossessed. So there was a sense of sort of desperation and having to use what could be found, which often involves scrapping together pe pieces of film that was left behind, finding magazines in the cupboard there, which proved that writers like Arnold Wesker had been in this place. And there was a moment when you felt that the written word and film could come together in interesting ways. It, it soon became apparent to me that, in fact, it didn't. And if I'd gone down that route, you know, the best I could hope for was to be an assistant of an assistant in a BBC cutting room. Um, and I didn't do that. I went away to Dublin for four years and came back and then by coincidence of meeting one of my old film school colleagues, we got to shoot a documentary in 1967 at a very seminal point in the culture at the Dialectics of Liberation, which was held in the Roundhouse in Camden Town. So I made this documentary on Allen Ginsberg and so on, and I felt, whoa, this was so easy because we'd put the idea in, it was accepted, the film ran. And I thought this was, this was my future life. Of course, it was also the end of it. It never happened again. <laughs> I'm still waiting. But what happened was that a group of people, the community kind of movement came out of that. The, the, the idea of people living in communal houses, uh, one particular drift to the east end of London so that a lot of people went there because it was cheap. And I ended up living in somewhere in Hackney where I still am 40 years later. Now, what I want to show you first is, is literal archive, because what happened was get to Hackney, start to explore what it means to live in this communal life in a new place, looking quietly, and, and the way it was is like the most primitive form of cinema. It's uh, an 8 millimeter, not a super 8, an 8 millimeter clockwork, Bolex, picked up of a market stall, outdated films from you could buy from a stall in Kings and Waste Market for a few pence, three-minute items inspired by the, the cinema of the American underground, Jonas Mika, Stan Brackage, people like that, and making a record of where we were. Head on, nothing in complex, nothing difficult. Archive, pure and simple. Okay, first bit, please. <laughs>
that's it, thanks. Uh, so on for 20 hours, but I won't keep you. Um, of course, as it evolved, it became technically more complex and dense. We discovered that this three-minute unit led itself to two basic modes, one of which was um, single-frame filming, so that you literally carried this thing around with you, click, 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 and made these immense catalogues of material in a very short space of time. And the other was superimposition, which was not the kind of sophisticated digital superimposition, but it was the kind where you held your finger across the lens and then ran it again and split the screen and did all kinds of stuff. So th this, this piece of kit went round with us and went into every aspect of life, right through to the period where these young people you see are beginning to have children, the children, you know, at that point, it all falls apart and the community breaks up and it goes away. But it's a, it's a very handy record and an archive. But it was shot on eight millimeter. The only way to see it would have been with a little projector there, throwing it up on the screen. It was initially silent. So it's already been mediated a little bit to what you see here. Because at one point when I realized the film would utterly disappear, I, I took, took it down to snappy snaps and got it put onto VHS. And then when I wrote a book about Hackney last year and was thinking about showing some footage just because I, I've archived not only visually, but I've used that archive as a memory source in everything I've written. And there's quite a lot in the Hackney book I've done drawn from looking at these movies. So then it was put onto a digital thing. And the sound was just a kind of quick job by Susan Stenger, who I'm collaborating with here again. And that's interesting because in terms of archival collaboration, we worked on a piece together called Marine Court Rendezvous, which was shown at Sketch Gallery uh, last year, but using all of those multiple screens. Absolutely static shots of a particular building in Hastings on the south coast that looks like a 1930s ocean liner. And it's now something of a ghost ship. There are old people there, strange people. It's kind of drifted out of time. And my metaphor behind it was that in these rooms, as you looked at this building at night, you could always see these flickering screens. And I believe that within the building, um, there was this movie, Henry Hathaway's Niagara, an incredible kind of Marilyn Monroe thing with this incredible sense of water. And I believe that the boat had sort of sucked up these waterfalls that would pour out of TV sets. So I wanted to use that, and we just pirated it. We just took it and, and gave it artistic license. So we took one, Henry Hathaway's Niagara, to um, a film by Cirque called Pylon, which is taken from um, a novel by William Faulkner. Ta uh, sorry, the film is Tarnished Angels, taken from Pylon, the novel by Faulkner, which is about a flight and about a, a small plane crashing. And the sense of the plane crashing into that building was so much a part of this place. So within the, the footage of Marine Court, these static images, just real-time, almost surveillance-like images of this down from the building onto the street, of the building, incorporated with that, gradually built up this sense of these stolen archive images and with a, a girl walking through the town. And the whole thing creates its own strange microclimate. So that's how the archive was used there. And it reminded me of someone I've also collaborated with, a filmmaker and researcher called John Sargent, who appears in the other clip. We're going to, well, he doesn't appear in it, but he's in the, the film of London Orbital, which I'm going to show a clip of. And he made a wonderful piece called Blue Summer. And this was when he was hanging out in cutting rooms in Soho, and he literally just scavenged in the bins at night. He was sort of sleeping illegitimately under the cutting room benches, and gradually assembled this incredible piece of footage all of found footage. Um, and he wasn't ever allowed to show it. He, he showed it sort of illegitimately in pirate ways. And it had a reputation. But it was the kind of insane exercise, in a sense, that he's made this large, epic film out of these things. And including shooting some of his own footage in the Welsh borders. But he could never show the film. So the film exists as a kind of memory, which is one of the archival drawbacks. And I thought also, um, looking at this footage, we, we showed them in a Rio cinema in Hackney, gradually put together a, a, a program of so much stuff that had been gathered together from the 60s and beyond right through to now. And, and a film that I remember uh, seeing in, in terms of what we're talking about now, 
very amazing John Smith film, who's also a long-term resident of Hackney, in which he, he goes round and he finds in the street, this is going back in time, strips of recording tape, just as rubbish, and films them and then plays a soundtrack of the kind of pieces of music and the locations where the tapes were found. And it makes a, a gallery assembly, but it, it, it had a kind of mesmeric, hypnotic effect when I saw it in the cinema. And I think one of the battles we've had all along is what you can legitimately draw. If I've seen these films, they're part of my memory. I was, I'm looking at Sound of Music and Coppola's Apocalypse Now coming, you know, why can't we have them? They belong to me. If I've, if I've uh, remembered lines of poetry and I, I want to put them, we've, we've heard the John Milton, you, know, that you want to quote that, you can. Nobody's going to stop you. But if I want to call up Henry Hathaway, it, it can't be done. This seems to me completely illegitimate. I mean, you end up with uh, projects like Jean-Luc Godard's Histoire de Cinema, where he gets around it and, and is able to, to draw upon these kind of things and create a memory, which is not only a personal memory, but a memory of the culture. Because I think the history of the 20th century, in part, you see cinema born and you see cinema die and become these new forms that we're looking at tonight, which is, which is quite uh, exciting. And those in themselves already, the Xerox principle of going back is so far that you're, you're seeing Coppola's Apocalypse Now and you think of that, but actually, obviously, behind it is uh, Joseph Conrad's novel of imperialism, it's Heart of Darkness. And for me, it's interesting because Conrad, when he's writing Heart of Darkness, has his own archive. He's gone up the Congo, he's seriously sick, He's got photographs he's brought back, and he's got his journals, and he collapses completely, and he goes into a building, the German hospital in Hackney. So he's sitting there in this hospital, recovering himself, and actually seeding together the fable that becomes Heart of Darkness. Meanwhile, on the street outside there, uh, women are dying who, who were machinists and lost their jobs and were too shamed to go out on the street and just starve to death. So there are all kinds of hearts of darkness. There are these layers, and these kind of projects suggest what that layering is. And I think what we've seen today in this kind of cannibalized imagery is that often at the bottom of the midden of cyberspace are these images of kind of war and dereliction in quite a, a sort of bleak way that you seem to arrive back at at the end of a lot of these processes. So we've got to keep it tight, so I won't go on. But, but the, the, the process I'm going to finish with is you, 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 you remember that diary archive, you remember the kind of nakedness of it at the beginning. By the 80s or 90s, I, I went into a, a collaboration with the filmmaker and writer Chris Pettit. Chris Pettit had been a film editor of, of Time Out throughout the period of the 70s. And at the end of that, he, through the influence of Wim Wenders, he got to make a film called Radio On that was interesting in the way that it, it kind of translated Euro cinema, German cinema, into an English landscape and looked at it another way. And also understood that you, you archive sound, you draw upon particular sounds and they work. And that's all you need. You, you don't need the success of narrative and drama. You don't need that presence of some figure that's going to tell you what you should think. You, you can treat the thing like a kind of endless installation. And we, we found that I was a book dealer at the time, and uh, Chris was buying books from me to, to do a, a book about Soho. And we, we ended up mostly talking about film, and eventually ended up with a series of uh, collaborations under the general title of The Perimeter Fence, which is still kind of ongoing but largely unsponsored, and is to do with cultural memory and going into archive. And we, we are trying at the moment to do an A to Z of London cinema without paying anybody for anything, which is really, really tricky. So maybe we can do a, a history of film without showing any film. He pulled it off uh, through the BBC with a, with a film called London Labyrinth, but that's disappeared and couldn't be re-shown, really, because it's all entirely made up absolutely of fragments of other people's films, including home movies, including feature films, including BBC plays, and it makes a kind of portrait of London as a labyrinth of images, and it's, it's very, very interesting, but very rarely seen as a result. 
So I'm going to show you to finish the, a clip from uh, the film I made with Chris Pettit called London Orbital. And here the argument is essentially evolved between two things. One, the, the notion of walking, because my method was always to, to walk. I walked right around the M25 and taking photographs just as a kind of logging process and to have that for the memory, for the record of writing. And he found that it was impossible to film walking because by the time he'd set things up, we'd vanished over the horizon. So he was comfortable really within the car as a memory system. He said, what I like is to have the camera in the back of the car, the front windscreen is a screen, it runs and it runs forever and you don't have to worry about cutting. And the only way he solved it in the end um, for a performance like we're going to do on Sunday night here at the Barbican was that he just let the camera literally just run while he went around the road and it became a um, non-stop endlessness. It's not quite what we got with the film here. The argument was between him shooting digitally and me accessing my own archive and shooting little fragments of film. So you will actually see what you've seen in its original form coming back now within a digital universe as a form of argument and as a way of accessing plural time. That both of those things can happen together. Personal memories and you, I'm archiving myself, as I said at the beginning, and that is the process that's gone into pretty well everything I've written and everything I've done in film. So we'll show you just that clip from London Orbital. rise and I'd seen them tumble. Motorway contractors like Lang were suburbanizing the inner city, throwing up estates that belonged on reclaimed brownfield on the fringes of Epping Forest. The choice was stark. Become a digital mudlark, rummaging through exhausted footage for retrievable images. Fool's gold dropped down the toilet bowl of the culture. Or circumnavigate the M25 on foot.
2000. Okay, I was taken by Vincent.